Hey, nerdy knitters, welcome to another edition of the Knitting 411 podcast where we answer your knitting questions. We've got a lot to chat about today. Three questions to answer, plus we'll continue our weekly chat. Of this topic this week is about joining stitches while they're still on the needles. Instead of seaming after everything's bound off, we're going to talk about two different ways you can um, seam your stitches together or join them together while they're still live on the needles. And of course, we have lots of other knitting chat to get to as well. So if you're joining me today, I'd love it if you'd pop in the chat, say hello, tell me where you're from, and we'll pop right into our knitting news. I ran across this article this past week and I had to save it because, of course, it's a Canadian girl here. She's 16. Her name's Alyssa. And she started knitting a few years ago or when she was smaller. And she started knitting things for her family and friends. And after a while, her, her family said that they had enough hats. So she then started to don donate the hats she was knitting to a local charity. And this year, over the course of the year, she knit 105 hats and then just donated them all before winter starts, which it's just starting to get really cold here. We've had a nice long fall and suddenly today it's freezing rain and snow. So winter has arrived and I guess she donated those hats just in time because they're definitely something that's needed for local charities and homeless shelters. So I thought that was really great news that um, the 16 year old was donating all of these hats. Um, she lives in Calgary, Alberta, here in Canada. Um, and I loved this. She said she just uh, kind of likes doing crafts and doing things with her hands. And she finds it relaxing. And I totally agree. Knitting is a great way to relax and still create something beautiful that you can keep for yourself, give to a loved one or a friend, or even donate. So that was a lovely story. And I'm always on the lookout for interesting news and stories about knitting. So if you ever come across anything, I would happily love to hear about it. You can leave a comment on any video or on the community page, or even send me an email with your knitting news. And it might be featured here on the podcast. So let's see who is joining me today before we get to what I've been knitting. Kay from Melbourne, Australia. Hey, it's so nice to see you here. Oh, let me put these on the screen. All the way down there. I bet the weather's nicer than it is here. Is it summer? It's summer in Australia right now, right? Or fall, spring? <laughs> I know we're opposite somehow. So thanks for joining me today. And Derek, hi from Houston, Texas. So nice to see you in the chat today. Okay, so I'm gonna pop over to my knitting camera and show you what I've been knitting. I've got a lot of stuff that I've been knitting this week. Let me see if I can get this switched over. There we go. Okay, well, I've just been, try I was trying to finish up one more row. I haven't quite finished it on this shelf with this beautiful yarn. This is um, Gage Dye Works. They've got beautiful self-striping yarns. There's a, a full skein of it right there. This colorway is called Whiskey in a Teacup. This one is 100% uh, merino wool, two-ply. This one is the same colorway, but it's in a merino cashmere nylon, I think. It's a sock yarn, but really beautiful colors. And I'm working on a new design. I had an idea that it would be fun to do a shawl that would switch between different stitch patterns as the colors changed. So I wanted one that had like longer sections of self-striping colors and their yarn is perfect for this. So you can see I've got a little bit of progress here. I'm doing this one in a top-down triangle shawl. I've knit one already in um, like a bias arrow shawl in a different yarn. Um, it doesn't quite work with this yarn because their color starts out with such a little tiny section, but it's perfect for a top-down triangle. And I think with this other skein of yarn, I'm going to do the same kind of thing, but do like a boomerang shawl instead. So those patterns will be coming out sometime next year. I'm going to self publish them. So when they're available, I will tell you right here. So this is really fun. I just wanted something that had some striping, but then swap between different easy stitch patterns. All of these are just two row repeat stitch patterns. So it's just a little something fun and interesting. And that's what I've been working on right now. Oh, great question. 
Um, yes, I will be doing a tutorial. I like to do tutorials for all my shells, just or all my patterns, just to help with any little details. There's nothing truly difficult about this one. You do have to know, like, well, I like to use a garter tab cast on, so it looks a little neater there. So I'll demonstrate that and then walk you through the different stitch patterns. And there is one little trick because if you don't pay attention to those color changes, let me see, like you can see here on the edges, you get those color blips on the front. And I wanted to avoid those as much as possible. So there is a little trick to switching between the stitch patterns to avoid those blips so it looks really smooth like there's no blips on the front of this fabric when the colors change and it's a really simple trick and i'll definitely have a tutorial about that so that is in progress right now i've got lots here so i've got to try to find a place to put this stuff um and i have a poncho that is on the blocking mat right now i can't really show it um it's going to be published next year in the um in february um these are some of the swatches for it though it uses twisted stitches this is like a motif that will run down the center and then it has these pretty cables simple cables that go down the side it is twisted stitches so you get that really i like the cool i like the look of a twisted stitch i just think it's really pretty it really bounces off the background of that reverse stockinette um and this yarn this is a Quebec yarn dyer here in Canada. This is her Journey Worsted Yarn, Julie Esseling. I think they're in Montreal, I'm not sure. Um, and this yarn is so, so lovely. I mean, I am not a yarn snob at all. I use yarn, I buy yarn from the big box store all the time, use it a lot. Um, but sometimes you get a yarn and you can just tell that, oh, it's just like a step up. And this one was that for me. Like it's just, it's got, it's applied yarn and it's a really high twist. I'm oh, trying to get it to show up on there. Um, well, it's a little bit blurry, but well, I wanted something that would be really good for that stitch definition because I really wanted those, those uh, designs to pop and the, this yarn was perfect for that. It's 100% wool, Rambouillet and Targi sheep. So I think it's North American breeds and has lots of different colors. It's just really just a lovely yarn. It's not scratchy at all. Um, and I, I, when I was working on part of the poncho, it, um, oh, I was just not liking some of the elements. So I think I ended up ripping it out twice before I finally got it the way I wanted. And the yarn was perfectly fine. It wasn't all kinked up and weird. I didn't have to do anything to it. I just started knitting with it again, so. It really is a really, really lovely yarn. And I, th I I have a link for it down below if you want to go check it out. Lots of different colors. Beautiful yarn for things where you want really good stitch definition, like for cables or like this twisted stitch design. It was perfect for that. Okay, let me see. I've got a few other things that sort of scrap projects. I don't know what you guys do. I would love to know what you do with your leftover bits of yarn. I'm always on the lookout for new project ideas. And I have a lot of... I use Knit Picks Palette a lot. They're fingering weight two ply yarn. It's great for color work, great for lace, and I've been using it for my master knitting. So um, I have lots of leftover. So last year I started these Advent mittens. The link for this pattern's down below too. I've even woven in the ends. I did these last year hoping them I would have them done in time for Christmas, and I did not. So this is one way I use up all my leftovers, but all different colors, all just scrappy little mittens. I'm on number 20. I think there's 24, 25, 24 probably. So I'm finally reaching the end of that. I will be happy to be done with those because that, that was a lot of work for those little tiny things. And um, the last thing I've been working on is this little scarf right here. My daughter has these Nendroid dolls and I finished another repeat of that little pattern and this is still I didn't even have the right needle size I think I'm what size am I using a two millimeter I think and the pattern calls for 1.5 I don't even have needles that tiny so I need to I need to get a pair I guess so I can knit some of these little tiny things but this I can only do a little at a time because it's so small and it's just finicky to work so it's definitely a labor of love if my daughter didn't want these I would not be knitting them <laughs> but she wants some little outfits for her little Nendroid doll. So that's something that will go in her Christmas stocking this year.
And that's all I've been knitting. So I'd love to hear what you've been knitting. Let's pop over to the chat and see what everybody is talking about over there. Oh, Maria is joining us from Pittsburgh. Hi, Maria. And okay, Australia, your weather. Okay. You're two weeks away from summer, had some cold weather and flooding. Oh, well, I hope it warms up soon. And Maria, you would like to knit something other than scarves. Well, dive right in, start a new project. Tell us what you'd like to knit next. I've got lots of, I, I mean, if you're a newer knitter, I've got lots of videos with beginner projects if you're looking for something like that. Thank you, Derek. You're, you're sick of knitting squares. This looks like a fabulous way for you to learn new stitches and create something beautiful. Yes. Yes. I'm not sure which project you're talking about, but oh, the, the, the shawl with the different stitch patterns. Oh, they're all super simple. Just garter stitch, stockinette, and then one of them is, um, let me see this one. Let me see if I can show it on this camera. This lighter pink. All it is is knit on one row and then like knit one purl one on the other and it creates this texture and then some eyelets, all really, really simple stitch patterns. And I really, I wanted to use something, yeah, something easy, but something a little bit interesting. So it's sort of, you can still watch TV and knit, but a little bit of interest in there. The poncho sounds lovely. Thank you, Maria. What book? Okay, I'll go back. I have to go back to that camera anyway, because I love to show you um knitting resources and knitting books we get a bit nerdy with our knitting here so i've got a few books to show you and they're for beginners the two books i'm going to show but this first one this this is um let me go back to that camera this is specifically for these little dolls called nendroids n-e-n-o-d-r-o-i-d -E -I, I think is how you spell them but um there are japanese dolls but you of course you can they can be imported around the world um and they have some books in english but they didn't have the knitting book in english but they at least not at the time they might have it now but at the time they only had it in japanese so i um am learning to follow japanese stitch patterns the directions are actually that one's really kind of crazy to look at let me try to find a simpler one okay here's the scarf i'm using the actual instruction section is very very short so i just took a picture of it and then looked at it in google translate to at least get a rough it was not perfect some of the words just uh they didn't translate well but enough so i could figure out what it was saying and then it's just a chart so charts are work in any language <laughs> so the one thing to know with um their charts though is their background okay they've got like a legend down here but usually the, the first few boxes will tell you what the, the background stitch is going to be. Like here in North America, um, we would have, you know, the blank box for stockinette or we'd have the, the little black dot for reverse stockinette. And if the whole project were in reverse stockinette, it would be filled with black dots. But Japanese patterns don't do that. They use these little charts to tell you what that background stitch is going to be. And it looks blank on here, but that is actually reverse stockinette on all those empty boxes. So that's one thing that's a little bit different. I actually prefer that because I think it's a lot easier to look at than looking at little, like lots of little black dots from the pearl stitches on there. I hope that makes sense. But another thing that is helpful if you're not sure what the background stitch is, you can look. They've got pictures of all the designs in here. Like, well, that's the scarf right there. So I can look at the pattern and see. I can look at the picture and see what the background stitch is. So. It's a really great book. Yeah, my daughter has marked everything she wanted. She wants all these little sweaters. And of course, like they have little cables and stuff and I'm using a toothpick for a cable needle and it's still a little too big, but they've got some really adorable little things, but it's an adventure for sure, trying to read a Japanese pattern, but very interesting. So there's a peek at that book. Yes, the charts. Well, I, I've been looking at other Japanese patterns, and that's basically what they do. They don't write out their patterns like we do here in North America. They have a very short, well, there's a little vest. They have a very short list of instructions, and then everything is put on, a, on the schematic. So I really, it's really interesting to work from a schematic like that. 
I, I kind of like it. It's very interesting. So while I've got this camera set up, I'm going to show you the two books that um, I wanted to recommend this week. Now, these are specifically for new knitters or knitters who really want to work on like their basic skills. Um, I've got a video coming up where I talk about using some books to learn. Um, oh, let me get that off the screen. To learn knitting because of course well I mean obviously a lot of people like to use um, YouTube or articles or things like that but a lot of people like to learn from books I love books so I searched my local library and found some recommendations for you and this is probably my favorite one the only issue with this one is they don't actually teach you how to do like the knit stitch or the purl stitch it's assuming you know how to do those things and if you do then you're one step ahead already. So this one, it's broken into different sections. Like the general advice section covers everything a brand new knitter would, on, would want to know. And it's just really detailed and step by step. So your section two starts with just knit and purl patterns and then adding different shaping with increases and decreases. Then it jumps right into cables and lace and knitting in the round. So it covers all the basic things very, very well. And it does it with swatches. Let me go to chapter two. Okay, so after the introductory things, you start with your knit and purl stitches. Oh, and I want to say too, I love the binding like this because sometimes if you're knitting and you've got a book that just won't lay flat, it's really, a really annoying. <laughs> so it starts out with really simple, um, a rib sampler. So you're practicing different rib techniques. It's got all of the basic things you would need for a pattern. But then it has these sections where it will um, translate everything for you, basically. So it tells you what does CO mean and why is it said this way and how to like tips for reading your knitting. Like it's just really, really a good book. Lots of small tips like that, but really incremental and step by step. And then you move on to another knit and purl pattern. So this is really, really great book for beginners. And a second one that I came across was this one. And I thought this was really great. I learned to knit um, with a dishcloth. That was my first project. So this is sort of reminiscent of that. And all of these are done. At least they use cotton yarn in here. So they're easy to care for. And there's projects for putting them together. But it starts right off. Oh, we'll start with the table of contents, I guess, um, with the different your basics, texture, twisted cable, lace, all of the different types of basic things. And after it introduces like all of the things you need to know about the book itself, and it has casting on and the binding off the knit stitch and all of that. And lots of basic things. Your very first square is doing the knit stitch and it, it has some basic advice. It has lots of full color pictures. And it even has a chart to show you what it should look like. So you can get started reading charts right away too. And then it moves right on, introduces the purl stitch and knitting a stockinette square. And then you progress, you start adding um, increases to create mitered squares and decreases. So you are learning all of the basics ribs and then you move on to more texture twisted stitches cables and then in the back she's got some ideas for um, what to do with all of these squares that you're knitting so I thought that was really interesting that was a great way it covers the basics really well it introduces a lot of things that knitters should know so learn how to knit with 50 squares this is um, the author right there Chi Lam and then Fear the fearless knitting workbook by Jennifer Seifart. So those are two of my recommendations. There. So let me see. That's off. That's my list for recommended things. I'm trying to check things off in my head. So I guess we can move on to the next part. Let me jump over to my slides. Okay. Um, bit of announcement before we get to our questions for the week. Let me move these books out of the way too. 
Um, we've talked about uh, class for reading your knitting and fixing your knitting mistakes because those two topics go hand in hand. You can't fix your mistakes if you don't know how to read your stitches. So I'm working on outline right now. So far, it looks like people are very interested in doing like sort of just the self-study where everything is just pre-recorded. They can watch, they can do the swatches and practice and just do it on their own. So we're going to go ahead with that option. But for the first group, I am right now, I'm, I've got the videos outlined. I need to get them recorded um, and then upload it to some sort of a platform so they're they're available because this is going to be a private class. It won't be on YouTube. Um, so once that's all done, I'm going to announce it here on the live stream and on the email list. And those people that are on the email will probably get first pick because I just want to have a small group to work through the information and the videos and the swatches and tell me what needs to be changed, what's not clear, things like that. So if you um, want to be updated about that, you can go to tanyanitz.com backslash workshop and just fill out the little email form. And I'll, be, I'll email everybody on that list first. So when everything's ready to go, we'll have sort of like a, a test group that can go through every, everything with me and make sure it's all really ready to go. And it will be at a reduced price, this first group um, because you're helping me as well to create this course, then you'll get it at a, a, a really reduced rate. So that's in the works. I'm working on the, the outlines are done. I've got to record the videos. I'm probably going to tackle that next week, maybe. I'm trying to get a lot of things done before Christmas break. I'd like to take a break and just play video games and read books and, of course, lots of knitting time. So that's it for announcements. If you want to get updated about that, just go over to tanyanit.com backslash workshop and join that little, it's just a little form. Just pop your email address in there and I'll let you know when things are updated for that. Okay, and last live stream, our community question was about the weirdest thing you ever knit. So if you're joining me here and you've knit something strange or what you would think would be weird, something outside the normal sweaters and scarves and mittens, then pop it down in the chat and tell me about it. And we only had a few responses to this question. Tracy has knit little socks for her exercise bike. And I thought that was a smart idea not to scratch the floor. And she's got me thinking about that too. I've got a new chair in my bedroom and I'm thinking it's going to scratch up the floor a bit. So I might have to knit some little socks for that chair. And Tracy has a husband who had some headphones and the little foam covers had worn off. So he asked her to replace them. And that's kind of interesting. A hand knit um, headphone covers. That's cool. Um, and armrest covers for your desk chair. I can't think of anything odd I've knitted. I do have a cast iron frying pan I like to use a lot. And the handle gets really hot. So I knit like a little handle cozy, I guess. That's probably the weirdest thing I've knit. I don't know. Anybody knit anything weird here? Okay. So we have three knitting questions this week. Let me get that out of the way. There we go. Um, Kaz wanted to know about how much yarn she would need to knit a blanket. Joni wants to know about knitting in the round when she starts a sweater and this, or uh, was it a sweater? I can't remember what. Yeah, sweater and sleeve knitting. Um, sometimes the needles, the needle length is too big. Um, and Mary had a question about that pesky last stitch. Have you ever bound off a project and you got that big wonky stitch right at the edge? That's really annoying. So we're going to discuss those three topics, those three questions, and then we'll dive right into our discussion about joining your knitting. Oh, Der Derek, not weird, but an iPad case. Well, it's outside the normal, I guess. So it's not weird, but yeah, somewhere in between a gray area. That's a great thing to knit too. Good job. Okay, so we're going to jump right into answering these questions. We'll start with Kaz's question. Um, she did elaborate and say she wanted like a larger blanket, but even then it's hard to say. Blankets come in so many sizes. Um, sorry, that the dog is making noise behind me right there. Um, so I did a little bit of a search and I found um, this chart online. Brand they, had, they had a lot of other things on this chart, but I just pulled... The, the section about blankets. Um, so you'd have to know what 
it really depends on the, the weight of the yarn you're using. Um, sometimes the yarn doesn't even tell you which weight it is. They don't use that little symbol that the Craft Yarn Council has, but they will at least have the stitch gauge and the recommended needle size. So you can figure out where it falls based on that. And this would give you a rough idea of the yardage. And then you could translate that to the ball of yarn. Like you have a specific yarn you want to use, then you would just take the one, like say you wanted to knit a baby blanket with yarn weight one and it's 1500 yards. So you would take whatever yarn you're thinking of, look at the yardage on that, and then use that to divide this yardage to see how many balls of yarn you have to get. If you want to get a little more calculated, if you want to really hone in on that, um, Jimmy Bean's Wool has this knitting calculator, and I played with it a few for a few minutes yesterday. So there's a link for this down below as well. Um, in that second box, you can type in the type of project it is, and then put the size that you'd um, that you'd like to to do. And then if you know what yarn you're using, if, even if you haven't swatched, you can at least get the gauge information from the yarn, and um, enter all that information in, and it will help you calculate that. So I hope that's helpful. Blankets come in so many sizes, and I'm not sure what yarn you wanted to use. So it's something you have to, um, there's a lot more details we would need. But this would help you at least get you in the right direction so you can figure out how much you would need. Hopefully that was helpful, Kaz. And moving on to our next question, Joni wanted to know about knitting in the round. Sometimes she has difficulty getting her needles to reach all the way around. The project when she's starting like uh okay her example is hat knitting or starting a top down sweater and sleeves can you talk about needle size and cord size to accomplish getting the needles to meet okay um this is the same sort of thing like when you're when you're thinking about the the sweater you're going to knit sometimes you think about like the full width what your your bust or your chest size and usually um a 24 or 36 inch circular lengths are commonly used for that. But of course, that's not going to work for a neckline because most necklines are not 24 inches wide. They're smaller than that. Or um, So you can start out with a 16 inch circular for a neckline. But what I really suggest doing is if the pattern has a schematic and it shows you um, all of the different area, the measurements for all the different areas, look at the measurement for the neckline specifically and see how how large or small it is because you're most likely going to have to start with what we would call a small circumference knitting method and i've got them listed here the different things you can use so you could start with double pointed needles or even flexible double pointed needles um, they come in sets of three they've got like tight like a a fixed circular needle but really short and small and um, you use them like double pointed needles or you could use the magic loop or traveling loop method the two circulars method or even small circulars that are nine to 12 inches long. So most likely if you're starting a neckline or for sleeves, you're going to have to choose one of these methods. You're not going to be able to use even a 16 inch it might be too big. Um, I think you, did you say that in there that I can't, no, I guess not. Okay. But sometimes like you can try 16 inch circular, but it might even still be too big for a lot of these things. So you're going to have to use one of these methods and then, when things are large enough, then you can just transfer your stitches over to that 24 inch or 36 inch circular length. Or even do two changes. You could start with one of these small methods and then switch to a 16 inch circular and then switch to a longer cord. But yes, that, that's an issue where you have to use um, a small circumference knitting method because it's just too small. Baby hats are another thing. And of course, socks, small things like that. You have to have another method because you can't use a long circular needle for that. But um, if anybody else has any advice, those are joining me in the chat for either of these. Um, the blanket, if you have like a knitting calculator or someplace you would recommend um, for figuring out how much yarn you need for a blanket or advice for Joni, then pop it right in the chat and I can share it on the screen if they're not here. And our last question before we jump into our discussion. <clears throat> that pesky last stitch in the traditional bind off. Um, I'm sure most of you have in encountered that where that last stitch is big and loopy and messy. Um, I don't have a swatch to demonstrate that today. I've got swatches for a few other things, so I didn't get a swatch prep for this, but I thought we could at least discuss some of the methods. Let me get myself off the screen. 
so you can see what's going on there. So why does this happen? Um, okay, now this loose stitch happens for a few different reasons. Um, the weight of the project, for one thing, if you're knitting like a whole big scarf even, or a shawl, um, as you're getting fewer and fewer stitches as you're binding off, all the weight is hanging from those last few stitches. So of course that gets carried along and you get these big stitches at the end. And also, um, as you're knitting across, I don't know if you ever start, sometimes if I'm really tense or something, I'll start knitting tightly, but then I slowly relax as I get across the row. So the stitches at the at, on the right edge are tighter and the stitches on the left edge are looser. And sometimes, especially if you're knitting like something square, you'll notice after that that left edge looks longer. It's because those stitches are looser and that that's very common. And another reason that happens is because well, as you knit, sometimes there's excess yarn in those stitches and it just moves along. When you're knitting flat, it's moving along to that edge before you turn your work and go the other way. So all of the stitches on that side can be longer and larger as well. And the last reason is because the edge stitches aren't connected on both sides. Like all of the stitches in the middle, they're connected to a stitch to either side on the right and the left of them but those edge stitches are connected to one stitch but then the other leg of the stitch is connected to either the row above or below so you get that wonky edge stitch so all of these play into this large last stitch and there's lots of techniques that people have used to correct them um, so i've listed some that i've run across here the i usually use the first one most often sometimes the second one um, so I would just wait until I finished and then I will take my knitting needle or a tapestry needle and I just sort of pull the excess yarn across back through some of the other stitches so it doesn't, it's not that noticeable. I think I probably do that one the most because, um, well, I'm working through the master hand knitting program and they do not want you to use any of these other methods. Well, you could do number two, but they don't want you to like pick up extra stitches or work in SSK or anything like that. Um, they want you to just do a standard bind off. So you can't use any of these tricks. So it's in my head not to do them, but probably when I'm done with the master knitting program, I'll probably try more of these other methods. Um, the second thing you can do is wrap the yarn in the opposite direction. If you think you have to think about it on the row before you bind off, because it's going to be the first stitch in the row before and you turn your work <laughs> it's hard to picture i know but i'm trying to picture it in my head so on the row before um when say you're working in stockinette you're going to purl those two stitches so you would wrap the yarn in the opposite way what they would call the eastern purl if you do the standard western purl which i'm going to assume you are well that's a whole conversation and that's going to be part of our reading your stitches and fixing your mistakes class is talking about the difference between these but if you just wrap the yarn in the opposite direction and when you come back to those two stitches on your bind off, you just have to knit them through the back legs before binding off. But wrapping in that opposite direction takes out some of that excess yarn. So it makes those stitches a little bit tighter and smaller and hides some of that weird wonkiness that that edge stitch can get. And then there are three other things that I found that you can try. And I'm, I'm sure there's more. If you have an idea for how to deal with that last stitch, please tell us about it. Pop it right in there in the chat so we can learn about your tip. Um, but if you, okay, the third one was knitting the stitch with the running thread between the last two stitches. If you think of like working, um, a, a make one where you pick up that, that running bar, pop it on your needle and then you twist it closed, um, to work a make one right or a make one left. Well, you could pick up that bar and then just work it with the stitch and picking up that bar also helps take out some of that excess yarn. Or you can, this is a really common one. Number four is knit the stitch with the stitch below. Um, if you slide that last stitch over to your right needle and then use your left needle to pick up the, like the left leg of the stitch and the row beneath it, pop that up on the needle and then slip that stitch back over to the left needle and then knit them together. That really tightens things up there too. Or the last thing is to try working the last two stitches as an SSK, just working them together as a decrease before binding off. And that sort of hides that last messy stitch. So there are a few things. That you can try for that good so those are all the questions we had if anybody has any questions they want to chat about you can pop them in the chat and we'll talk about them after we talk about our um discussion for the week
Thank you. Oh, Cass, I think I called you K earlier. Sorry about that. I'm glad you're enjoying watching. Okay, so we have been talking about the different ways you can join your knitted pieces, and we've discussed the bound, the, the, when the stitches are bound off, the most common way is with mattress stitch, and we had a whole session all about that. There's um, this thumbnail for this video. You'll find the link down below in the video description box. This is on Suzanne Bryan's channel. She's a master knitter, um, and she has a whole tutorial on the many different ways you can seam. You can swatch. You can make your own little swatches and practice seaming. I really encourage you to try that before you tackle a sweater or something like that, just to get used to the different ways it's all mattress stitch but when you have different combinations of stitches and rows it changes how things are done and it's another situation where you need to really understand what's going on and how to read the stitches and then our last live stream we talked about the other methods back stitch overcast and slip stitch crochet which aren't probably as commonly used but are options if you wanted to try them out and now we're going to move on to um, joining those knitted pieces, but joining them before you bind them off. So you have stitches that are still live on the needles. Um, two method. We're just going to go over two methods today. I'm not going to do the bind off seam. There's actually even more ways. I was looking even through in Vogue Knitting. They had a section on joining pieces that are bound off with pieces that are still on the needles. And it feels like this would be a never ending topic. So it's something that I don't think you run into that option as much, but you might. So it's something that you can explore more on your own if it's a topic that interests you, but we're just going to cover the basic ones here. So we've got um, two that we're gonna talk about. We'll start with Kitchener Graft. Now, you've probably run across this if you've knit socks from the cuff down because very often when you're finishing the toe, you have to graft the stitches together. And I remember the first time I knit socks and I did the, the Kitchener Graft and I was pulling it tight because I thought, you know, that it was like a seam. But what I've learned since then is that you don't pull it tight. What you're basically doing is creating another row of knitting. If you look at that picture there, usually you have your needles in one hand. So you've got the fabric. The fabric's not laid out like that. It's, it's back to back and it's not like top to bottom. But when you lay it out this way, this is really what you're doing. You're, you're sort of sewing it up so you're creating another row of knitting. So you don't yank it tight, it's not a seam. So this is um, one of those things where it's not sturdy. Like I wouldn't use this for a sweater. I wouldn't use this on the shoulders because it's not gonna add any sturdiness to it. It's just really another row of knitting. I would use it when I want something seamless, like the toe of a sock where you don't want that seam along your toes or um, oh, I've got, I've got something here I'll show in a second. Um, I knit an infinity scarf. Um, so I joined the two ends together so it looks perfectly seamless. So I would use it for something like that, but I would not use it for the, the shoulders on, on a sweater because it's just not going to give you that sturdy hold. You really want, if you're going to use seams, then you they're there for a reason. They're there to, to hold that sweater in place and give it its finished shape. So it's not like a lot of times if you knit um, sweaters in the round, there's there and depending on what's happening at the shoulders that um, all your those missing seams, um, depending on the fabric, it can sort of corkscrew around your body. But when you have seams along the sides and the shoulders, it helps hold that sweater in place. So Kitchener Graft is not something I would use in that situation. The next one we'll talk about I would use. Um, but I'm going to switch over to my other camera and I'm going to give you a quick demonstration of what the Kitchener Graft looks like. Let me see. <laughs> Technology switching back here. Okay. All right. So this is the cowl I was talking about. I'm not even sure I could find it, but it's completely seamless because I used that Kitchener Graft. But with a cowl like this, you don't need a seam to hold it in place. So it was perfectly fine. No, I can't. Oh, right there, maybe. Nope, I don't know. I can't tell where it was. <laughs> so when you want something seamless, Kitchener Graft is great. And it can also be done in different. Let me see if I can find. There it is. Get my swatches out here. It can be done in different fabrics. I'm going to demonstrate with stockinette. 
say you had the two pieces of a sweater together and you wanted to to put those two pieces together you do it like that but you can do it in other uh, stitch patterns this is one of my swatches from the master hand knitting program from level two I had to resubmit this one this was my resubmit um, but you can see this purple it demonstrates the graft so obviously it looks a little bit different because it's in a different color but ideally you would do it in the same color and you wouldn't be able to tell that was like um, say you were joining two shoulders like you would bind off right there and graft them together so that's what it would look like in garter stitch. I'm going to demonstrate in um, stockinette though, because I think that's most often when you see it done. Let me try to move this in a little closer. There, that's better. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so you start with, usually you, um, you might even use the tail of your project. I would use the tail from the back piece. So you put them with the wrong sides facing each other. So sort of like we see on that we saw in that picture. If we did it flat, it would look like this. And you're just going to make another row of stitches. But there's a method to it. So you start on the front piece. There's a setup section first where you take the first stitch and you insert a zip to purl and just leave it on there. This is just a setup. And it's this actually the second step of what you're doing when you actually do the method. Leave a long tail to weave in. You go to the back and you insert as if to knit and leave it on. And there, and then you've done this setup. Now, if I were doing this on a pair of socks, I actually skip that part because I think it ends up with, it gives it that little weird ears along the side and I like to avoid that. So you can skip that. For something like shoulders or other seams, I wouldn't skip it at all. So once you've done the setup, it's a two-step process on the front needle, and then it's a two-step process on the back. And I don't think it's, I mean, it's just a matter of remembering where you are. So it's like knit this one, drop it off, purl that one, leave it on. And that is your step for the front needle. So you insert as if you're going to knit, let the stitch come off, insert as if to purl, and leave it on. And because you're creating a row of knitting, you want to sort of mimic the stitches around it you don't want these giant wonky stitches try to keep it beneath your needles so you we already have a little stitch right there so we want to keep it about the same size so we can use our other end to work that down okay we finished the front now we go to the back and you can always tell where you are by the location of your yarn like we just finished purling that stitch so now we're moving to the back and we repeat this but now it's reversed we purl off and then knit on and then pull the yarn through and take your time keep it below the needles try to create that new stitch so it looks like the other stitches and then back to the front knit drop it off purl leave it on so it's just a matter of remembering where you are so the back we are purling and dropping off knitting and leaving on so it's just like creating another stitch. You can see them already right there. We've got a few very messy edge stitches. We do a few more and then I'll take it right off and you can look at it. So knit, like insert like you're going to knit, take it off, insert as if to purl, leave it on. And make sure it stays under the needle. You don't want another accidental stitch because of course you're going to use probably the same yarn that you're using for your project so you have to pay attention so insert as if to purl drop it off insert as if to knit and leave it on there okay so let's just look you can see it looks like a row of knitting now of course my tension the tension's not great so what i would do is I would just use my tapestry needle to sort of pull on the legs like that and sort of work that extra yarn to the edge and then use the tail to tighten it up because you want it to look just like the knitting above and below. Obviously this doesn't, it's a bright orange. That looks a little better. So all you're doing is mimicking the movement of the yarn. You're weaving it back and forth to create a new stitch. So. That is one way to join pieces that are still on the needles.
Anybody have any questions about that? You can pop them in. I'll, I can demonstrate again if you need me to. Okay, so um, if there's no questions, we'll move on to the next one. which is the three needle bind off. Now, unlike the Kitchener graft, I would recommend this for a shoulder seam because you're binding off the stitches, but you're binding them off together. And it does produce a really good sturdy seam and you can work it in two different ways. You can, well, I'm gonna show two different methods, but you can work it where the, the like we did for Kitchener graft, where you're working it, um, the standard way is to work it so the, the right sides are facing and you're binding them off and that seam will go along the inside. But you can also work it the other way where you have the right sides facing and that seam will end up being visible on the outside. So if you wanna work it in a different yarn or you just want that decorative edge, like it can really look kind of, kind of neat on the shoulder to have that seam showing. So I'm going to switch back over and we will demonstrate the three needle bind off. Let me get this one out of the way. Now, the standard way to do it is with, like it says, a third needle. So you would take your pieces. Oh, here's another swatch from my master knitting program. And you can see even, you would definitely want to work this. If it's going to be an invisible seam, work it in the same color as your project because you can see it right there. It, it's not totally hidden. But on... Um, it does create this cool braid. So if you worked it, so the outside, so you worked it the other direction and it, I'm gonna show you with it on the inside, but if you worked it on the, maybe I'll actually demonstrate it the other way, we'll see. Um, you work it so the right sides are facing instead, you would get this braid on the outside and it would really look kind of cool in an alternating color. But. If you want it to be invisible, then definitely work it in the same color because you can still see it there. So all you're doing, yeah, let's demonstrate it with the wrong sides facing. If you wanted to hide it, you would have the right sides out and you would just bind off the stitches and that seam would be on the inside. But if we want to have that exposed seam, then we would reverse that. We'll put our right sides together and we'll bind off with the wrong sides facing us. Okay, and I'm going to use a different color so you can see what that looks like. So it's just like binding off really, but you're going to bind off two stitches together. You insert into your front stitch as if to knit and insert into the back stitch as if to knit. And I'll use this different color. Usually you would grab that tail and just use that. And you're going to pull that new stitch through both. <laughs> this is hard to do with a different yarn. I think it would be easier with the tail. Okay, try this again. Okay, so pull that through the back stitch and the front stitch, and then those can both drop off your needle. And they're sort of your setup. Okay, let me get this in my other hand. <laughs> okay, so we insert again, front stitch, back stitch, wrap the yarn, pull it through both of those, let those stitches drop. And now it's like a bind off. We've got our two stitches, so we're gonna pull that first stitch over the second, because we wanna bind off these stitches. So insert into the front and into the back, pull through, drop off. But um, instead of a, you can use the needle like this, or you can use a crochet hook, which I think is a little easier. So let me pull that through both stitches. Oops, I dropped, didn't go through that one. Okay, pull through that stitch, drop it off, pull through that stitch and drop it off and then pull the stitch over. Okay, I prefer to use a crochet hook. I just think it's a little easier and you can do the same exact thing. Use a crochet hook that it's about the same size as your yarn or a little smaller. So insert into those stitches, grab the yarn, pull it through, drop them off, and then pull it through that one as well. Same thing, but I find it a little bit easier with a crochet hook. Pull it through, drop them off. So 
If you don't want to do like the standard mattress stitch seam, then you can do this. Oh, and I, I did it wrong, didn't I? Okay, yeah, I meant to show you where this would be exposed, but I had that backwards. If you um, want it hidden, you have your wrong sides out and not, I, I think I told you the other way around and I was wrong. Um, if you want to want it hidden like this, that was how it was done. You have your your wrong sides facing you and the right sides are inside and you seam it up and you get that seam. I meant to demonstrate the other way where you would have the right side facing you and you would have that hidden seam. So I did it backwards. Sorry about that. But you can see what it looks like. It gives you that really cool braid along there. So it's another one I guess you should practice before you try it on your sweater because Yep, I even got, I, problem with learning things is you just make bigger mistakes. Oh, did I miss a stitch? Yeah, I did. So go in between in the front stitch and the back stitch, pull both through both of those stitches and then bind off that stitch. So it's really simple to do. It does show through on the other side if you're trying to get it invisible. So you'd want to use the same colored yarn, but if you want it to be shown, then like I said, do it with the right sides facing so you can show that braid as you move across. So that is a three needle bind off. And Kaz, you prefer, yeah, the crochet. Me too. I just find it a little bit easier to work and I really need to get um, some bamboo or wood needles for demonstrations because those stitches just want to slide out of those metal needles while I'm doing that. But okay, so yeah, so if you want it exposed, then whatever side you want it on, that's the side you work on. So if you want want it on the outside, then you're gonna you're gonna do it from the outside. Does that make sense? I had that backwards when I started. I should have looked at my notes one more time. But that was the end of our demonstration. If anybody has any questions about those, let me know and we will address them now. <sighs> okay. And our community question for the week. Um, this is where we're at so far, if you wanna go over and answer that one. Are you knitting any gifts this year? This is the results right now. Um, if you're knitting gifts, tell me what you're knitting. I'd like to know. Um, I don't think I, I don't think I am. Just some little Nendroid things for my daughter. That's all that's on my list. No knitting for anybody this year. Hmm. So if you're knitting uh, gifts for people, I'd love to hear about them. What you're knitting? Um, we've had a lot of responses already, so you can add your response to that if you want. It doesn't look like we have any questions from anybody this week. Thank you so much for joining me. It's been really fun chatting with you. Um, so if you're catching the replay or you have questions you want to talk about in the next episode, because we're coming up on an hour, whoo, it's a lot of talking. If you have questions that you'd like to talk about or um, things to discuss, I need some new ideas for our new discussion next year. We're going to start with our, the rest of this topic. Um, the original question was about the ways to join your knitting and also to cut your knitting. So we're probably not going to tackle that until the new year. We will talk about when you would want to cut your knitting and how to do it. Um, but after that, I don't have anything lined up. If you have a topic you'd love to discuss, then you can leave it down in the chat or in the comment below and I'll add it to the list of things that we can talk about. Or if you just have a specific knitting question, leave that as well. And we'll talk about that. You can leave those down below the video or hop over onto the community tab and look for that picture. And you can leave your question there. We'll have the date for the next live stream. So that is it for this week. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh, and we do have a question. How many rows between cables? Well, it really, it, this is one of those, it depends on the cable. You could have a simple two stitch cable and you could cross it every other row, every fourth row, every sixth row. It can vary, it really, it depends 
on the, the cable that you're using. We're going to have to do a whole thing about cables, I think. Oh, and Entrelock. Oh, <laughs> you're the third person to bring up Entrelock. I have done, I've done a swatch. I don't have it handy here. For I'm on level three of the Master Hand Knitting Program, and you do all of these different, this is sort of like the show off what you know kind of level. And I found out how much I didn't know. I had to do a lot of research, and Entrelock was one of those things. I will give you a tip, though, for Entrelock. Learn how to knit backwards because you're turning so much for all of those little strips of fabric that it's so much easier if you can learn how to how to work the pearls because usually it's in stockinette if it's in stockinette instead of having to turn the work to purl learn how to purl without turning your work around and it makes it a lot easier but yes we're gonna have to <laughs> address entrelock i think i did not enjoy that swatch I'm not sure I'm going to do much more entrelock, but we will tackle it here. Oh, you're welcome, Kaz. Thank you for joining me. Okay, your cable. Cable is four. Should it be four rows between? It really shortest between rows when oh when designing your own. Um, try it out. It depends. You can cross them every other row. Like give them one row in between, but you can cross them every four rows. It's really up to you. You can cross them every six rows for like a long rope. Um, I would recommend, oh, I don't have it here. Um, is it Alice Starmore's Erin Knitting? She's got a great section on cables. And she talks about that, how like the progression of cables, like you take a simple four stitch cable and it changes the look of it depending on how, where, where you, how many times you cross it or how often you cross it. You, it's really tight, small rope cable if you cross every other row, or really loose cable if you cross like every six rows. It's really up to you and what you want want to want it to look like. Or um, Barbara Walker's, I think the blue, I think the blue one she has, let me see if I can find it, and I'll show you what I mean. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna switch over to the other camera so you can see okay here's a picture this is from barbara walker's um a treasury of knitting patterns the blue cover it's our first edition the first book um so we have a four stitch cable left to right that first one is crossed every fourth row oh that's the only four stitch one okay but here's two six stitch cables these two right here this one's crossed every sixth row this one's crossed every eighth row same cable you're just changing changing where how often you're crossing and that affects how it would how it would look so the same with the four stitch that one's crossed every four rows every fourth row but if you did every sixth row it's going to look looser the eighth row it's going to look even looser you can combine them this one's crossed quickly there and then a long time and then more and then two more there so it's really up to you how you want that to look I hope that was helpful. Um, cables are really fun. I really like them. Okay, but that looks like everybody's questions. Um, I think we're gonna wrap it up right here. Thank you so much for joining me. It's been a pleasure hanging out with you and answering your knitting questions. Be sure to leave your questions for the next episode, which will be in two weeks and I'll see you then.